Zoom. Welcome, you Zoomers. We're so happy that you've joined us tonight. We've got a great program going on for you tonight. I'm Captain Jim Sharp. This is my little wife, Meg, behind me. The, uh, she's the one that concocted this whole scheme here of uh, schooner cooking. And uh, we've got a great long program full of excitement for you tonight. Sharps Point South, the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum. We started this museum, my wife and I, a dozen years ago. And it's been growing and growing ever since. And we're not going to waste much time tonight on uh, peripheral stuff. We're going to even cut our, our commercial a little bit short so that we can get right to the heart of the, the meat of the, the program here tonight. The meat of the program is schooner cooking, of course. Now this thing doesn't want to switch. Isn't that funny? Every time I start this out, it doesn't want to switch. So I'll have to... There it goes. Schooner cookies. <laughs> <laughs> They're schooner cookies. I, I, take my, I take my hat off to the schooner cookies. I do that uh, willingly. Uh, the question, question is, who's the most important person on these old vessels? <laughs> it isn't your tax man. It isn't your accountant. It isn't your banker. It isn't your CPA. It isn't even the captain. It isn't even the plumber. It's the cook. The cook has to do it all. The cook has to be there. She never gets a break. If it's foggy, the captain can sleep in a little bit, doze and then wake and doze and wake, but the cook doesn't. He's, the cook has to be up early, get that fire going, get the heat underneath that water, and get it out on deck so everybody will have it. The cook never gets to sleep in. The cook has to be there all the time. The most important person. Well, I want to tell you, little bit more about the most important important person but I got to give you a little bit of the commercial just a little bit we'll do this very quickly this is the museum the way it looks well today with the snow on the ground over on the left hand side is the old museum and over on the right hand side is an empty lot oh my god we can't have an empty lot when they're the main part of the museum is bursting with memorabilia we've got to do something about that so we decided we'd build another building down in the rendering below is the new museum building and over on the right hand side is the existing building so you get an idea of what we had the scheme that we had in our minds first thing you have to do is get a backhoe you get a backhoe i love this picture of meg sitting on the backhoe you get a backhoe and you make a whole lot of noise and when the neighbors start to complain you know you're making progress <laughs> this is the way this is somebody's laughing there in the background glad to hear that this is the way the building looks today the last rose of summer there in the fall. This is the way the building looked up there in the upper left, of course, is the building in its, uh, in its incomplete state. Now we're going to fill that 4,000 square foot building full of antique boats. And I'm quite excited about getting that going. But I got to tell you a little bit about the SCIF program. SKFF, Sail Kids for Free. You got to remember that. SKFF sail kids for free. We have sailing sail training program, week long sail training program for kids. We take kids from eight years old to 14 years old. Kids that don't know anything about a boat, don't know anything about water or anything else and they come down and we teach them right from the get go. They, over on the left there, you see them, these little tiny kids, they're setting their sails up, learning how these boats are put together. They're learning what a centerboard is and what a rudder is and all the rest of it. They get them put together, they get in the boat and we give them a shove off of the dock there and they drift around in circles for a little while until they figure out what they're doing. We have a great teacher, Diane Sternberg, she takes them out there and tells them what to do and how to do it. And they're learning their minds, their little fresh minds are like sponges. They're soaking this up. Look at this little kid over and right there with a great big smile on his face. He's got a sail full of wind and he's leaving his buddy. His buddy's in the other boat over there. One kid per boat. These are only six foot long Optimus prams. One, he's his own captain. He's got to be here. He isn't going to get anywhere. My God, a week's training. And look at them out there. They're sailing around the buoys, having a grand time of it. And uh, it's just, they get so excited about it, they forget their telephones. This is the, this is the way the class goes, the first day orientation and learning all about what the boat is, how do we stay afloat, what you do to make it go. And then the next day, <clears throat> they're going out to the, you see the wind out beyond, beyond, out beyond the, uh, 
end of the dock there. They get out into the wind and the th day three, they're going around the buoys out there. They're really sailing. They learn how to turn the boats over and ride them back up again. By the fourth day, they are really getting proficient. They're really ganging up together and sailing a course. By the fifth day, they're graduating. Who wants to go sailing? Everybody puts their hands up. They all want to go sailing again. Yes, sir, they get out there and they forget the, even the internet. Now, this is the way we do this. We need your help. If you donate $100 to us, we guarantee you, we not only put a kid out on the water for a whole week long sail training, but we'll match that with another kid. We'll put two kids out in two boats on the water for that same $100. What a deal, what a deal that is. And you know, it, follow it off. If you, follow, if you can donate 200, you get four kids, to 300, get six kids, do the math all the way up to 500. You get a whole class, a full class of 10 kids, free sail lesson, lessons. They go out and uh, 10 kids to it. Look at the, $100 takes two, look at these two kids on the right hand side there. $100, but put those kids in boats and they're out there for a whole week learning how to sail. And the guy, the guy over, I'm the captain. He said, well, he is the captain. He's the only guy on the boat. And look, he's got his hand on the tiller and he knows what he's doing. He's running off before the wind. And just, the guys have a great time. But that's the way we do it. We pay our staff, we buy our sails, we get our boats together, and we do it with donations. We couldn't do it without you. So don't forget us. We always get some different kind of donations. A couple, of weeks, a couple of months ago, the Morning in Maine, the sailing vessel that runs in and out of Rockland Harbor, two-hour cruises, two lighthouses, and uh, it was donated to the museum. We have a great guy, Tyler Watterson. He's going to be sailing that boat this summer. Uh, all summer long. So want to go sailing, give us a rent, give us a jingle, sign aboard. So, so much for the commercial. Let's end the commercial now and start in on the meat of this subject. <clears throat> the old adventure, the old schooner adventure. She's the first in line. Schooner, <laughs> schooner adventure was a fishing vessel way back when, 1939, Leo, Leo Hines was the captain in 1939. Leo Hines, the guy over on the left there, he is an incredible captain. He had the adventure for 20 years and set all records in the fisheries in her. <clears throat> He's caught more fish, made more money for his owners than any vessel of any type fishing on the Grand Banks from 1934 to 1953 that he had that vessel. An incredible, incredible fisherman and a pretty darn sagacious man about hooking up uh, picking up cooks. He hired Patty the Wig March, uh, in March, well, 1939, Patty was on board on that date. And that date was the worst trip Leo ever made to the Grand Banks fishing. Patty the Wig, what a name. Patty Nolan, he went with Leo as cook for many, many years, almost Leo's whole career with the adventure. Patty, Patty the Wig was the cook. Patty the Wig, what a funny name. But Patty had this malady, this strange malady, I guess he was born with. He had no hair, no hair on his head, didn't shave, no hair on his arms, no eyebrows, no eyelashes. He had a toupee that he would put on when they would get ashore on the weekends when they were off. Had a toupee under his hat and they called him Patty the Wig. And uh, he, he was an old curmudgeon. He looked down at his pants there. He had brand new pants on that time. Leo told me one time, Leo went sailing with me six times on the adventure and he would sit around in the main cabin and tell stories about his fishing career. And he'd tell stories about Patty the Wig. And I get such a kick out of him. He, he enjoyed Patty very much. He said, see those pants? He said, those, those pants cost, Pat, cost Patty 12 bucks and they're brand new. And you can tell they're new because you look at his hands. He rubs his hands on his pants all the time. And in a, in a week's time out on the banks, he said, those pants are black. And the old curmudgeon, he had this funny habit. He, he would lay the plates out on the tables, you know, and he'd take the plates. And the first thing he would do when he gets a plate, he'd put it under his arm and he'd wave it across his chest. And then he'd lay it down on the table and then get the next one, wipe it across his chest, lay it down on the table. And that way, <laughs> sure that the plate was clean when he put it down in front of the, the person he had. Leo said nobody ever got sick, so it must work. And that's the way he did it. You know, <clears throat> actually, <clears throat> being a cook on a fishing vessel isn't all that. It's no cakewalk. It's no walk in the park. 
they had four meals a day on the schooners. Four meals a day. They didn't cook three. Daddy Wig cooked four. He was cooking all day long. And it's tough. You know, they get up in the morning at two in the morning and they start to bait up, get ready for the day. First thing they do, Patty goes up and rings the bell. Everybody comes down for breakfast. So then they get that meal down and they go back up and they fill the dories up and they go fishing. They come back from fishing. They're hungry as a bear. Another meal. So then they dress the fish, take all the guts out of them. After they get that all done, get cleaned up after all, all that labor, another meal. And then they go down, ice the, uh, the catch down and so on. And then they have the supper before they go to bed all day long. Patty is putting that stuff together. All day long, his new plant pants are getting dirtier and dirtier. Now those pants, uh, uh, they bring on the rest of this story uh, on March 13th, well, March 12th, actually, they were leaving Boston Harbor down in the lower left-hand corner there. You can see the adventure with the dories stacked up on deck and the pilot house back there. In 1939, they're headed out to the Grand Banks. They're going out to George's Bank uh, to go fishing, going out to the gully out of George's Bank. So they're leaving Boston Harbor. They're headed out and, and getting out into the, <clears throat> into the thoroughfare there. The men all waving goodbye. You see them at the rail there, waving goodbye to their wives and their sweethearts uh, on, the, on the dock as they go by. Uh, wives and sweethearts hope they never meet. You look around on deck there and you see all the dories piled up there between the masts and the tubs are trawl all over the deck house back aft and they're bound for the Grand Banks and the George's Bank, 145 miles out off Cape Cod, uh, out off the mainland, 145 miles and they get on to George's Bank. Well, they steam all that afternoon. They steam all that night. They get down on the banks down there, and by God, there's a breeze of wind blowing. All of a sudden, the wind turns around. It was nice and calm on the way out, and the wind turns around. All of a sudden, it's in the northeast. Oh, my God, Leo's looking up, and it's puffing up to 20, 25, 30 miles an hour all of a sudden. And they lay, too. He says, well, it looks like a northeaster coming. We're going to have to wait a little while and see what happens. So they jog around, jog around, and, and wait. And breeze keeps coming on and coming on. And Leo says, well, it looks like a lay-by day, boys. We're going to have to give it up today. We'll have to go fishing tomorrow, see what the weather's going to be. So that's a terrible time for Patty the Wig. Patty the Wig goes down. Of course, it's raining out there, and it's getting gloomy, and the wind's puffing up at 25 and 30 knots. And the sea's starting to make up 10 foot, 15 foot of sea. And Patty the Weed fires up the old stove. It's, they used coal in the stove in those days. And he put a good charge of coal in there and shook her down, got her going in good shape. So that the men that are on watch and are wandering around up on deck, there they come down, they're all wet and, and blown apart. And they can sit down in Patty's chair. He had a chair right alongside the stove here. And they can warm up. So that's great. And they were all away playing pinnacle and so on down in the forecastle. And uh, finally, after, after uh, lunchtime there, uh, Leo, the old captain, came down. And he said, my God, he said, the wind settled into the northeast is going to be a bad one. He said, you know, it's going to blow. We, we've got to settle down. We're going to have to just spend a day here until things calm down a little bit. Vessel started to jump around and so on and so forth. But he said, uh, by afternoon, uh, it was really coming on strongly. Leo came down. He said, told the gang, he said, you know what? It's getting getting so bad out there. It's it's, it's blowing forty knot. And it's going to blow hard enough to blow the hair off a dog. He says we we better go up and we better settle the vessel down. Take all the all the tubs of trawl and all the trawl and all the gear and put it down below down in the hold so it doesn't get washed overboard if we get a big wave. Double we'll grape the dories down so they don't get away and put everything to rights. So the men put on their foul weather gear, all their oil skins and. Patty, Patty the Wig down there at the stove, he saw everybody troop out on deck. Oh, good. He says, this is a good time. I can start the dinner now. So let's start the supper. But while everybody's up on deck, they're setting the vessel to rights and they're, they're putting the gaskets on everything, double griping the dories down. And uh, Titus Wimble and, and uh, Henry Abbott are up on top of the gaff there on the mainsail and they're putting gaskets around the mainsail. And the spume is blowing by. The northeast is really in great shape now, blowing 40 knot. Oh, all the rain is coming horizontally, and the, the waves are going by. The waves are running 25, 30 feet high now. And uh, 
uh, they're getting things set to right in spite of the spume, in spite of the roaring of the wind and the, and the rigging and everything. They could hear this rumble, low rumble, sounded like a train, sounded like a railroad train. Couldn't figure that out at first. Titus Wimble turned to Henry, Henry Abbott and he says, I, I hear something that doesn't sound good. Henry says, oh, go on, you're just hearing things, Titus. And just then that, Leo comes out of the pilot house. He says, boys, there's a big one coming. You better run for it. Titus jumps off the, the, the down on the deck there and he runs for the forecastle and dives down in the forecastle. Henry Abbott turns around and the rigging's close, much closer by. He says, well, I'm going to run up the rigging. So he jumps on the rigging. He runs up almost to the masthead in the rigging. And then over beyond, all of the rest of the sounds kind of mute out and this great big roar gets closer and closer and they look up and my God, it's a real wave coming. One way these waves, they gang up together sometimes. And here was this wave 40, 45 feet high, all white and frothy on the very top of it coming through the gloom and coming at an incredible pace, a man killing wave coming right at the old schooner adventure lands right on the side of the bow, starboard side of the bow, crowds right on that, picks up that 230-ton two, vessel, picks it up like it was a toy, throws it down on its side, throws it right over on its beam ends, like it was some kind of a toy thrown across the living room floor. And Henry Abbott's right up there at the masthead trying to get away from the sea. All of a sudden, he goes down, the sea's coming right up in his face. He's on the top of that wave, but as the vessel's laying over right on her side. Oh my God. But the adventure, the evil vessel she is, 35 ton of ballast in her boiler, punching in cement in her bilge, righted her up, and the vessel stood right back up again. And, and while it was down there, Henry Abbott, he, he looked down and he said, he could see the waterways 10 feet under. It was a, such an eerie sight to see the waterways laying down under 10 feet under the water. Anyway, the vessel raided itself up down in the galley. The old cook, of course, trying to make dinner. Oh, my God. He got tossed around. Everything went he, all over the place, all over the galley. And uh, uh, all, all the pots and everything, he, as the vessel turned down, he ran, ran over and ran, sat down in his chair. He knew his chair was, was tied down so it would be a safe place. His chair was right on the, on the port side of the stove right there. And... Uh, Sure enough, he sat down and the vessel tipped over and everything, the coffee pots and all the pots and everything else came over, headed right for his lap. Oh my God. And when the vessel got all the way down, the stove lids came off, red hot stove lids came off and they were headed right for his lap. Oh my God, he thought to himself, oh, there goes my manhood. These things flying down, flying down and following all the rest of them is a half a pail full of live coals headed for his lap. But at the same time, that wave came over the companionway. The companionway is right on the other side of the stove and a half a ton of water came charging down the companionway and completely drowned everything. The steam came off the top of the stove and the water went all over everything, wet, uh, patting the wig down, uh, just uh, a smother of the flames and he wasn't even hurt. But it sure did ruin that new pair of $12 pants that he had on. The, the stove lids got to the pants, but it didn't get to him before it cooled off. Oh, my God. Up on deck, of course, the wave swept the deck. And the pilot house with four men in it went over the stern. Four men in it. One man made it down the companionway in the main cabin. Leo was washed across the deck. He didn't even know it. He was under the water so far. He thought he was overboard. He was washed all the way 60 feet up into the middle of the vessel when the when the when finally the water drained off the deck and the vessel righted itself up there. He sat three broken ribs. He couldn't pay any attention to that. He, he could. Saw the pilot house was floating behind the stern of the vessel. And he looked down and here, uh, the, 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 two, the two men, the other men that were in the pilot house, Billy Nolan and Alex Muse were both of them in the water there. Billy Nolan seemed, seemed to be uh, partly alive. He was hanging on to the, the, uh, the house, but uh, Alex Muse uh, let go and neither of them had life jackets and both of them were drowning. Leo grabbed the lead line, he threw the line over and it landed on top of the, on top of the house 
and uh, Alex Mew is hanging on there. He, he reached over and he grabbed a hold of it, but he couldn't hold on to it. So Leo tried to pull him to the vessel, but he couldn't hold on to it, and both of the men were lost. That was the end of that fishing trip. They licked their wounds, <clears throat> started the engine, and worked their way back home with a flag at half mast. Two men died, two new widows, five fatherless children, and not a single fish to show for that trip. You can read the rest of it, those, those different uh, news items on YouTube because this is all being, being done. Let's raise the bar here a little bit, come back to a little bit of craziness, a little bit of gaiety, change the mood. Here we are on the old adventure with a parcel of cooks up on the strong back <laughs> over the oboe. It looks like we just went into Booth Bay Harbor, anchored off the Fisherman's Wharf there, Windjammer days, I think it was. Everybody was hiring a kite. And these girls were up there, they were singing songs, and it was just a hoot. They were having more, more fun. The cooks, uh, you know, the passengers always join the cooks, and everybody gets together and they have a great time. And they get out of the galley for a short time. And uh, the old adventure galley, there's the adventure galley. Th this was probably a later picture than the early days, but uh, everything in this place. And Petunia pump there, which they'd polish every day, the great big old black iron stove. Uh, that was a shipmate stove, 450. That's what these fishermen all had back in those days. And uh, in the same place it was when Patty the Nolan was cooked. Everything the same there, except the little different arrangement in the shelves. And that big box is our ice box, where, where we, of course, keep everything. Well, <laughs> the cooks all, the cooks that come on these schooners, some of them are more than cooks, they're really chefs. And uh, the, many of them write cookbooks, one after another after another. And when the passengers start to bother them about how they cook this and how that, they cook that, it's a great time to sell them a cookbook. But there's some of the cookbooks, I'm sure there have been more, far more than that's written. The first, uh, the first cook that I had, uh, other than my wife back in those days, was Jan Pomeroy. At least that's the first picture that we have of a cook. And Jan, are you there? Did, did Jan sign in, Robin? Did you see Jan Conrad? I, Jan, I don't know. Jan, if you're there, would you unmute and come on, please? I think it was 1966. I bought schooner in 1964 and uh, outfitted it. And uh, 1965, we were almost cookless. We had the whole parcel of different books. <laughs> and then finally, we got Jan. Was that you, Jan? That is... I hope so. <laughs> Can you hear me? I hear you now, yes. Okay, good, good, good. Speak up, speak up, Jan. Tell me. Okay. Tell me, tell me something about that old black iron stove. Did you ever cook on a black iron stove before the adventure? I had not cooked on a black iron stove. I'd never sailed on a, any kind of a boat. I think I was in a canoe once in my life, and that was it. Well, what did so, you get this crazy idea to join this schooner? Well, um, my friend Amy Lowe. Amy Crockett at that time, said that you needed a cook. And I came down and interviewed. And for some reason, you thought I could do the job. <laughs> my, mo my mother had taught me how to cook, but I have never cooked for more than a family. Well, so, boy, I had a lot of, I had yes. a lot of faith in you. That was, <laughs> that was good, well-recognized faith. You cooked how many years? Three summers. Three summers. Best, co best college Here. job ever. You're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> yes. Was that night? Was that 1966 when you started? It probably was about then. I don't remember exactly. And for three Captain, summers, Captain yes. Louise Louise was the cook in '66 and '67 when I was on board. So was I was I was after that. Yeah, who's, next year. Who's talking? Pammy. 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 Yeah. Pammy, I was on girl. Yes, I was on board with Louise as the cook in 66 and 67. 
<laughs> and you giggled the whole time. I did. <laughs> you were the greatest mess girl. Everybody <laughs> loved you. Everybody did all the dishes for you because you were such, such a sweetheart. That's right. And, and, and Jen, you put out the most fantastic food. You were such a sweetheart. And well, I'll it was never, it was really I'll, fun. I'll, I'll <laughs> never forget it. Then you went off and you got married, so we, we lost you after three years, huh? That's right. But I had and, I had a good follow up. <laughs> and you had a good follow up. You taught Lori, Lori. Yeah. And Lori, Lori, are you on? Do you think she signed in, Jan? I don't. I don't know. I can only see four people who are signed in, so I don't know who's there. Uh huh. Well, Lori she, was your mess girl, you told me, I think. She was mess girl uh, my second year, and the third year she was my assistant cook. So she took your job, Pammy. And and you uh, you told her how to cook then, Jan, huh? Yes. And this, this is you This is you and Lori, Lori, and who's the other girl? Uh, Gail Cotta. She was in the... Dishwasher, mess girl. Oh, she was a mess girl. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Great. Well, Lori, Lori wrote to me and she said that she got she got married finally, and uh, her husband said, "Oh boy, I married a cook, but she only knew how to cook <laughs> for thirty people." <laughs> right. <laughs> she did, she said she didn't know how to cook for one. <laughs> that's right. We, well, we all that's struggled a, with that one. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing how you cooks got along so well back in those days. It was just absolutely fabulous. You learned as you went along and you did a fantastic job because people came back over and over again. You know, the most glorious thing about cooking, when, when you take a week on a windjammer and you come back and you meet people at the dock and the first, uh, they meet their friends at the dock and the first thing the friends ask them is hey how was the trip and they say oh it was fabulous and then the second question they ask is how was the food and they say oh my god i think i gained 10 pounds and that's because of you cooks i take my hat off to you cooks i salute you because that kind of advertising you can't buy anywhere that is the greatest advertising oh I, the food was just absolutely fabulous and it was right from the get-go I told I my think cooks because they're so brutal. <laughs> I told my cooks I didn't care what it cost. I wanted the best food in the fleet. I want the best food, and <clears throat> uh, they gave it to me. But every morning you had to be up at seven in the morning, six in the morning, five in the morning to get that stove going. Jan, when you started that stove, did you start with kerosene or did you start with kindling? Kindling. I wouldn't trust kindling, kerosene. That, yeah, that's the way. I used to lay in, lay in my bunk and I could smell the, the start of the stove when the cook got up and went to work on it. Mm -hmm. And it always, it always smelled funny when they used kerosene to start the stove. Right. Yeah. Your I still bunker. have a wood stove in my kitchen. Do you? I and do. You, you, you still work on it? So cook yes. on it? Yeah. We still Nine have months of the year. <laughs> Great. We still have a stove. And uh, in our kitchen, no wood stove, Glenwood Sea. So you had to have a coffee out there at seven o'clock in the morning because all the passengers are out there just waiting for it. That's right. And then, of course, then there's breakfast. You were ringing the great old bell there, that old bell that I got off of Crotch Island and we polished up. <laughs> and you ring the bell and everybody comes down, look at them, they've got stacks and stacks of pancakes there, they're, they're devouring. That guy on the left there looks like Pete Anderson. Do you remember Pete Anderson? Oh, yes. Yeah. Do you? First, first mate. Yeah. I'm Pete, not seeing Pete. the picture you're seeing, though. Oh, you're, you're not? No. Uh -oh. What do we have? Delay here? I don't know. May it just be what, me. What, what picture do you have, Robin? Um, 1967, there's a bunch of people in the galley on the left eating off of checker diner, diner um, tablecloths. Yeah, there you go. A, they're eating, bre eating breakfast. That's a, Are you seeing that, uh, Jan? I'm not, but that's okay. I've been there. 
Well, <laughs> I know, but I want to talk about the right picture here. <laughs> anyway, over on the right is the, the cook's worst nightmare. He ate so much for breakfast, they had to resuscitate him before lunch. <laughs> and of course, the lobster bakes. So are you getting this one, Robin? The lobster yes, bakes we are. Is, the lobster bakes were so very important. Of course, everybody loved the lobster bake. We used to call that the cook's night off. Well, that's a bunch of bunk. Of course, the cook had to cook what five, five pies. I think Jan, didn't you cook five pies for the? For the I thought it was there? six, but maybe it was five. Well, it might have been six. <laughs> anyway, there's Mark. You remember Mark on the other side there? Mark was a mate that year, back in ninety six, ninety six, seven. And there's Jan. There's Jan dump, dumping the lobsters. Can yes. you see that one? See that one, Jan? I, I, I can see now, yeah. Yeah, I had good. to push something. <laughs> dumping the lobsters out of the pot, getting everybody ready to have their lobsters. And they'll line right. up on the beach there and they'll have their lobsters. There's the old galley uh, back in the, in the days. And then uh, Jan Bridget. went on and got married on me. And then Lori, Lori went. And I don't remember what cooks came on in between there. But finally, Bridget came along. Bridget, are you there? Bridget, un unmute, Bridget. Tell me, about, tell me about this. You, you came on in 1974, I believe, did you? That's correct. I cooked on, I cooked on Timmerwin in 72 and 73. And you, you, learned how, you, learned, you learned how to cook before you got to the Timmerwin. Well, I grew up with a family of 11, so Bill figured I could cook <laughs> for 20, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you had a wood stove at home? No. We just no. barely missed it. I was a generation out. My mother cooked on a wood stove, though, when she grew up. I see. Well, you cut your teeth on the timber when, and then you came over and cooked on the adventure? That's right. And for how many years? I was, you got them up there just right. It was 74 and 75 and 78 with Pat. I see. And uh, in between, what did you do with Queen there? Well, that was the year you you went to New York with Dee Carstarfin and uh, Dee cooked for a couple of years. Oh, Dee cooked in there. I couldn't remember that. She cooked in there. I see. And then you came back in 78. What did you do? The go get married after that? <laughs> nope, it was quite a while after that that I got married. <laughs> Did you cook on other boats? Um, um, I cooked on the Bowden that summer that I was off in 76 for, with John Nugent for, I don't know, a month or so. He didn't have a full, a full calendar, but oh yeah, he had a number of trips that year. I see. <clears throat> I see. Good. That's well, the year that uh, I broke my leg. <laughs> I came on uh -huh. for a trip at the end of the season and uh, broke my leg. What a silly thing to do. <laughs> With the Tarzan swing. With the Tarzan swing. Well, now, isn't that funny? I happen to have a picture of that. <laughs> here's, the, here's the crew we had, Motley crew we had at that time. I don't remember all their names. That looks like Kenny Winslow with the curly hair. Is that right? That, yeah, that's Kenny. Is and that's it, Kate Cronin, <clears throat> Kate Cronin Kate, uh, on the left. Yes, that's Kate, half a Kate. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's oh. Kate on the Tarzan swing, too. Oh, is it? Yeah. Gee, I should have I should have called her up and told her to take a look at this. Yeah. <laughs> There's you with your oil skins on on a foggy day. Yeah. And row, row a boat. I don't know I who think, was on I the... think that's I think that's when I was on The Wrestler with you. Um, I joined you in uh, New York City and went down the Inland Waterway for a couple of, I don't know, a month or so. Is that right? I'm pretty oh, sure. That's, I, 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 I don't that's, remember that. I, I, there's so much in my damn head. I can't remember these things. I'm not that's surprised, fun. Jim. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm so glad to know that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know you tried the Tarzan swing, didn't you? That's me on the right. Everybody, is that you on the right? Yep. I picked the right ones then, huh? 
Yeah. Well, it was great. That Tarzan swing was really very safe, but it was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. People, you get out there with a vessel with a good angle to heel, and it looks like the vessel's sailing by you. But by the time you swing back on board, you're coming in slowly, and it's a very graceful, easy landing. That was the greatest swing. That was before insurance problems and Coast Guard regulations and all the things that we enjoyed back in the 1960s. Oh, so day. anyway, you mentioned D. Carsas, and there we caught D. Napping. <laughs> uh -huh. a, you, you cooked magnificent meals. You cooked volume, voluminous meals. It was just grand. I always, <clears throat> I always told the cook, make more than enough. Don't ever, don't ever leave uh, the table with nothing on it. Always leave something on the table. Well, spare desserts and and always have seconds on everything. Don't ever uh, slight the volume of the of the cooking. And you, you were great at that. You fed everybody to the nines. <clears throat> Dee, Dee came on. Dee was a masterful chef. She was an amazing woman. She cooked a, on her husband's boat down in the Caribbean before she joined us after her husband passed away. Two to three <laughs> minutes. Five at the most. Pardon me? What was that? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, Dee's taking a little nap there on the main halyard. And I used to think she had spent so much time up on deck that she must get down and, and cook once in a while. But she had the whole thing under under control. She would go down and flip it over and come back up and take a nap. And meals were always on time. They were always wonderful meals, gourmet meals. And she wrote a couple of cookbooks. There's one of the cookbooks. So she cooked in that internet a couple of years when Bridge took a holiday, I guess. And moving on then, I, I can't tell you the cooks, uh, the next progression of cooks. They came and they went and they came and they went. And the girls cut up vegetables over and over again. They're the whole gang looking over the side. I don't know what they're looking at, but the girls are still cutting up vegetables. And they're still cutting up vegetables. Every day they were up on deck cutting up vegetables when the weather would permit it. And of course, then they would line up. Looks like chowder for lunch there. We serve chowder. One, sometimes we put it up on the deck house, but we had it up on the deck house one time and a breeze of wind came along, the vessel heeled over and we decided, well, we better set it up on deck from here on because uh, uh, you never know when a breeze of wind's gonna come along. People would line up and they would pass all the groceries up and then they would line up and they would chow down. And there's George, a little list is getting later on now. <coughs> The cook, uh, Georgia, you're there, I know. I am. <laughs> and you look like you're cleaning up the, after the, making something. And... I, I think I look like I was half asleep at that point. <laughs> that must have been towards the end of the week, because at that point, I was usually down to uh, the t-shirt turned inside out. Because yeah. white yeah. patty, I'd wiped my hands so many times on it that, uh, you know, I was looking pretty grungy by Friday. By Friday, after getting up at five o'clock every morning, too. Five o'clock? That's <clears throat> sleeping in. No, no, four, four fifteen, four thirty. Four, four o'clock on Monday, four thirty the rest of the week. God, I, well, I'm glad you did it quietly. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it's great. I could always smell the smoke coming coming back, wafting past my bunk, my ventilator there. But yeah, you know, I mean, you and you'd stay up playing the guitar half the night too. You know. Yeah, yeah. we usually went until at least ten thirty or eleven. You yes. deserve to be. Yeah. When did you first start on the adventure? Well, I came on as a passenger um, the very first week in nineteen eighty five. Uh, that was when, uh, that's when you and Joe Garland launched the book, Queen of the Windjammers. Oh, uh, yeah. Adventure book, yep. And I came on as a passenger. I had previously been on the Louis R. French, um, where I believe it was Bridget's sister, Margaret, was cooking. Um, I oh. might have that wrong. I don't think, it was, I believe it was Margaret Coyley cooking there. And Margaret's been, on here. Oh, Margaret, yeah. Did you cook on the Louis R. French in 84? No, it was the another sister named Liz. Liz, that's it. My bad. There, yeah, there were a lot of you. No, no. 
<laughs> but anyway, seriously, I, so I came on the adventure and I just, I had never sailed. Um, I was a kayaker and a canoeist, but I'd never gone, been on a sailboat of any sort. And I just fell in love with it. And more importantly, really fell in love with Maine. And um, so I basically, at the end of the week said, is there any way you ever need any help? Is there any, anything I could possibly do to come back? I can't afford to keep coming back as a passenger. And oh, as it boy. turns out, yeah, and as it turns out, you needed someone for the last four weeks of the season, um, and that was as the what was called then the galley girl. And, and uh, I could I, I could pay you below minimum wage. Absolutely, and I was <laughs> I was thirty I was thirty years old, and I replaced a uh, fifteen year old. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it it was, it was very humbling, um, and I washed an unbelievable number of dishes. But I had the time of my life, and uh, I was lucky enough on that very first week, one of the reasons I chose the adventure as a passenger was because of the music. And that yep. you had a piano on board, plus you, you know, all the pictures kept showing the guitars and singing, and all of that really just fascinated me. And uh, yep. I had played piano since I was a little kid. So anyway, I came back, and uh, what, I was down. What coke did you replace? Uh, I didn't, re okay, I initially came on as galley girl and then oh, yeah. Tracy Stortz was the assistant cook and right. Janice Hofer was the cook. Oh, well, she, yeah. you came oh, on Janice, at that time. Yes, Janice was in her right. second year, I believe. Uh, anyway, in her second or maybe third year. And yeah. uh, so I finished out the 85 season, 86, I came back as galley girl because there really wasn't any way to move up. And uh, <laughs> um, because Tracy and Janice also came back and then Janice left uh, in 86. So in 87, Tracy and I co-cooked and 88, we co-cooked. Uh, and that, oh, really? was the, that was the last year of the adventure uh, in the Windjammer business. That was the last hurrah. Yeah, and there on, 88. Yeah. Uh, I, I got all on, my orders in in 89 when the, you yeah. know, the curtain came down. So. Yeah. And there, there's Janice in the left-hand picture. Yeah, serving up chowder. Serving up chowder, that's right. Went yep. for the whole gang there. And uh, I guess that's you in the right-hand picture, putting the, yep. putting I, the food out. On a nice calm day, we were putting it out on the deck house on that one. Going well, under the Deer Isle Bridge. The only reason that you are seeing me in the lunch line like that when it still looks plentiful is I was making your plate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was my meal. Slam. Slam. <laughs> no, seriously, you know, the cooks <laughs> the cooks never went through the lunch line. I mean, no galley crew went through the lunch line. And to be fair, the crew members, the deck crew didn't go through until the very end. But uh, I, I was in charge of making your plate each time. So, of course, it included a lot of peanut butter. <laughs> loads of peanut butter. <laughs> and, yep. It has not changed. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you know we used to play all kind of funny pranks on you and put you know plastic bugs and things in your soup and hide them no. under the napkins and stuff like no. that. So, yeah. Yep. Well, can't believe it. Can't yeah. So I was probably still a galley girl at that point. Yeah. That you see. And, and of course we're making cracking ice cream there, making ice cream. Yeah, that's Todd, who was a uh, debt crew member. Uh, he had injured his hand that, that week, but that's Todd right. sitting on top there. Yeah, he was sitting on top of the mast up there, and he put his fingers down on the block when I jived over and got him caught in there. Yep, and but, the uh, only person that went through the lunch line right after that was a doctor that was on board. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, and there's the ubiquitous lobster bake. There's Mike McHenry. And yeah. uh, who, who's the guy in the back there? Is that um, Rick? Oh, o? that's um, um, Brian. No, that's Brian. Rick O'Farrell. Yeah, that's Brian. That's Rick O'Farrell. 
Is it Rick O'Farrell? It looks like Rick O'Farrell with long, long hair. I shot the picture. It's Rick O'Farrell. Oh, okay. Hey, Rick, oh, yeah. how are you? I'm doing well, I good, thought Kelly. it was Brian that was part of the uh, part of the deck crew that year. Yeah, it was we got curly, curly mop of hair. Yeah, no, I've got other pictures of Brian, but this is Rick. We, right. we got we got a lot of pictures that we've got to dedicate from Rick. Uh, it's really terrific yes. that he came along. There, they're picking up their their butter for their lobsters. They're going to sit down on the rocks and have their lobsters. And there you go. You get back from the lobster bake, and we got to have a hoot nanny. We always have hoot nannies, whether it's on deck or down below, down in the main cabin. There, uh, we have hoot nanny most every night, but not always. But uh, just to show you, the cooks have to have more talent than just to perform at the stove. <laughs> they have to be quite versatile. The passengers are always dreaming of some crazy thing for us to do. They make, make up shows. They make up the, all kinds of different things. Well, Romeo and Juliet was concocted by uh, the dear old thing, this elderly woman, that she was just full of beans. And she made up this skit for us and insisted that she Shelley play Romeo and insisted that I play Juliet. So you see, we have to have all kinds of different talent. We have to be imbued with different talent to be on a windjammer. There we are having a great time on deck. Old oh, Daniel yeah, that's the Labor Day. That's the Labor know. Week crew, Labor Day Week crew there. Is, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Yes. Mike, Mike McHenry at the wheel there. And uh, that's another of Rick's pictures. And uh, oh, what was the name of the barrel chested English? That's Cliff Haslam. Cliff Haslam. That's right. Haslam. Yeah, that was my first week on board with was with Cliff for Folk Music Week. It was a yeah. fabulous, fabulous week. When when Cliff sang, it it sounded. Gordon Box said it sounds like you're throwing around anchors on the foredeck. <laughs> Such a powerful guy. Anyway. There you are, Shelly. You're down there, Georgie. You're down there uh, uh, and having a bite to eat or something. And no, this is Stacy. Uh, this is uh, my co cook, Stacy, uh, on oh. the right hand side with Robert Havis, uh, who was yeah. on the crew the last two years. Great, great crew guy. Great crew guy. Yeah, he sure was. Whatever happened to him? I do not know. I lost track of him about 10 years ago, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Now you see the cooks do take coffee breaks. <clears throat> That's that was our escape route. Um, we would get breakfast on the table, and the galley girl was in charge at that point, and Tracy and I would sneak up on deck. Um, yep. And that's when we would actually sit for a couple of minutes and have a mug of coffee. Yeah. Well, I guess it was you and Tracy in 1988, and who else? Uh, uh, primarily, it was Annie Killam's, Annie Killam, Annie Killam's daughter, um, oh. that was our um, our galley girl that year, and yeah. we had some fill-ins at the end when she went back to college. But yeah, she was she was our last uh, last galley girl, and uh, yeah. one of one of the things I wanted to say was, you know, you talked about and you hit it right on the head. One of the first things you ever told me uh, <coughs> came on when I began to cook was that it has to be the best absolutely and always more than enough so that we always told the, the passengers that we needed to weigh them before they came on and then after <laughs> they left on Saturday and that you paid us on a commission basis. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, most of them believed it. By, by Saturday, they believed us and they decided <laughs> we were getting pretty rich off of them actually. <laughs> they learned how cheap I was and how I cut back on everything, <laughs> except the food. We never, we never cut back on the food. Oh, you never, you never did. But I do no. want to question why I never had a chair like Patty the wig. <laughs> we never had a chair in the galley. <laughs> well, you had your own hair anyway. Well, this is true. Not a lot, but I had some. <laughs> yeah. Cook, cooks are amazing. Cooks are artists, you know, and they're all a little bit offbeat. They're all not quite on center like everybody else, but they have this <laughs> artistic gray matter up in their head. And it's they put this food together and not only is it taste good, but it is, looks good. And it's like painting a painting, a little dash of red here and a little dash of blue there. And the food comes phenomenally. I take my hat off to all my cooks on the adventure and we'll shift gears now and we'll get in 
to the Windjammer. Angelique, we've got to keep moving along. We've got so much to do here. <laughs> Debbie, <laughs> Debbie, you must be there. Debbie, you must be there somewhere. I am. Hey, Debbie. Come, I, it, it says Robin DeVivo. <laughs> and that's my sister. I don't have a computer. Oh, <laughs> I see. Well, we know who you are anyway. Yes. <laughs> this Angelique had a, a galley up on deck. Really spoiled the cooks. I thought that it was terrible to have a galley up on deck, but that's the way it is. Most of the boats have them down below. But there I was told I had the best galley in the fleet because I was on deck. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And there you are with a window right beside you. You could write, just look out and see the, the, the scenes passing by. That's pretty soft. That's pretty nice, isn't it? Two windows and actually two forward windows and a starboard window and a port window. How voluptuous. And we oh. served out of the starboard window. You did. I wondered about that. Everybody the... walked around the deck house to the starboard side to pick up their soup. Very, very convenient. And, yes. and I'll, bet, I'll bet every passenger walking from aft up to forward sticks their head in there and says, what's for dinner, Cookie? All the time. All, All the, time. the time. Must have driven you crazy. No, never. <laughs> you were you were 22 years but you've been on a lot of different vessels haven't you tell me about your career well you know i actually sailed on the angelique for the first time in 1982 and 83 is that right and then no. in 1984 for the op sail to halifax i was a guest on board the flying fish oh and then hmm. in 1985 and 86, I cooked on the mercantile. Uh -huh. Who was the captain on the uh, Angelique in the beginning? When I was a guest, it was Mike uh, Mick a Anderson. Oh, it was the Andersons. That was back in the 80s, yeah. Yep. That, I think that in 82 was their second season. I see. Mm -hmm. But you were a guest. You didn't cook? Not in 82 and 83, but I, I was hard pressed to go home in 82 because they needed a mess cook to finish the season and I wanted to stay. But the friend <laughs> that I went with told, reminded me that I just bought a new car and that <laughs> I could make car payments on $75 a week. Yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so you were 22 years cooking. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that, that's pretty much of a record. Best job I ever had. And you wrote a book? Yep. Yes, wonderful, I did. Wonderful book. And, and I, most of your career with Mike, uh, Mike McHenry? Most, all, yeah, most of my career with Mike McHenry. See, we're serving out that starboard window. Yep. Chowder? Probably chowder. Yep. I see the guy in there with a hungry look on his face. It and looks that, that way. A, that's the old stove, but that's not a wood stove. That was a diesel stove? Kerosene. Kerosene, yes. Kerosene stove, that's right. Yeah. I guess you could burn, burn both. There you go. Yeah. And a wonderful, wonderful food came out of there. Oh, there's Every, Miss Katie. Yeah, there's Miss Katie, and there's her birthday. How old was she? I count, count, count the candles. It's hard to see. I'm not sure. Maybe that, Rick that's, knows. That's Captain Mike McHenry and Lynn McHenry. This is Brian Heckler's photo, so I don't know. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, but uh, he had sent them along to me. I thought this was a great shot. <laughs> looks like eight candles, Jim. If I zoom in, it looks like eight candles. Yeah, yeah. I don't think she's eight. <laughs> I, I was going to say, she doesn't look eight at that point. I think they overstoked the cake. Who's, who's the girl? Who's the girl be, behind a? Um, oh, Debbie. Who's the girl behind Debbie? That's Pat Poria. That's hey, the uh, Pat Poria. That's right. She sailed with me so many times. I recognize her, but I couldn't. Yeah, and you got Margaret uh, in back behind Lynn. And you? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm moving moving along here because. We've run out of time. Look at that stuff. Oh, my God. Doesn't that make you hungry just looking at it? That wonderful, wonderful food. 
Devin, you certainly are a master at it. And look at these, just one more. You can see that person coming in through the window, stealing those things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and here's Dennis. Dennis took over then. And Dennis, uh, Dennis, you shouldn't be putting wrenches in the stove. You're supposed to be putting wood in the stove. Didn't you know that? No, he probably had to ream it, and he's putting it back together. <laughs> Did it plug up once in a while? Well, it was very persnickety. You had It took an hour to light it in the morning because you had to warm it up slowly. Oh, and, I didn't. And I'll tell I, you, that stove's still like that. It is? She's still... Still real for snaggedy. Yep, and then of course you have to tack it because there's two chimneys and you have to oh, yeah. tack down the windward one or you blow right. the fire out. The, the downdraft down huh? from the main. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, always something. So it took quite a while, just like your wood stove, quite a, quite a while to get that one going. Oh yeah, you got up real nice and early and yeah. you coax it along and you prep it and then you um, get all your water on for coffee and then you take a nap for an hour because it, then it <laughs> takes an hour for it to get hot enough to get cook anything and boil oh, your boy. water. You must, you must have loved it for 22 years. I who are, did. Who are, these, who are these gals here, these galley gals with great big smiles on their faces? I'm not sure, actually. Well, I can tell you uh, two over here on the uh, left-hand side are from this past season. We've got Meredith up in the top and then Caroline down there in the bottom. And I think if I, I think Rick might be able to tell me for sure, but I think that's Marty the legend there in the middle there. Marty is in the middle. Kaylee Soud is uh, below him on the right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kaylee, yeah. Uh, Wearing the toque that uh, Pat Weiss uh, made for her. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And here are more of them. Where, where, any names here? Yeah, I, I, think can give, I can give you some names. Uh, that's. Um, Is it Hoppy? No, that's Ruth Ann Keister on the left. Uh, in the middle, we've got. Um, Maggie Whitman, and on the right we have uh, Ian, um, Ian Ian Michael Flanagan. <laughs> Rick, you're amazing. It's all and, written down in my book. Yeah, and uh, here I've got a thing that blocks out this, but uh, this is the famous lobster bake, the ubiquitous lobster bake, all the time. And this this is the new guy. Uh, That's me. That, that, <laughs> Mr. Alaska, come on here, Mr. Alaska. Tell that's, us what's going on. That's me right there. This is Dennis and I doing our our, uh, our standard dance there. His uh, yeah. his favorite line is, Bradley, they turned red again. And we yep. get that. <laughs> his favorite line. You're all red. Then you're well, we like to do a few burgers on the fire after we uh, after our bake. We call it the surf and don't turf eat, option. Don't eat lobsters. There you go. Yep. Everybody loves the lobster bake. Well, now we got to oh, move yeah. along. Here's the schooner Bowden. I'm not going to say too much about the schooner Bowden because uh, I guess uh, Rick is the only one that cooked on the schooner Bowden anyway. But um, uh, Clayton Hudson was the cook back in the old days. Uh, I, drove, I ran the Bowden in Nova Scotia one time, and I used to run her in the fall just for fun. I owned her, for, I had her for seven years. And we rebuilt her and ran her in the windjammer business for four years. But uh, her stove, you can see her stove, the lid on the front end of the stove opens down so that there's a little tray there where you can put things down and then shove them in the oven. Well, we were going across the Bay of Fundy one time. Fundy with its 60 foot of tide up in the very top of it has terrible currents, especially when there's a breeze of wind. The Bowden was like a young colt. She's only 88 feet long and she is so lively. We were going across there. We had a bird in the oven. And we hit a wave, hit a wave so darn hard uh, that it jolted, jolted us. Uh, one of these real steep waves and uh, caused by the current in the Bay of Fundy. Anyway, that oven door opened up and she reared, the vessel reared up on that wave and the old bird rolled right out onto the tray in front. And the cook was standing right where he is there. He looked down, he saw the bird there, but of course the vessel was 
jump and then so he was hanging on before he could do anything and the, we got hit in the side on the starboard side by a little wave and that bird rolled right off of that tray and down onto the floor and skidded across the floor because the vessel was now healing over uh, to a uh, port healing over on his uh, starboard side way up in the air well, you look at the picture on the left there and you see the stove and the door right there, that's the head door. And when it struck that wave and the bird came out of the oven, that head door bounced open. And when the bird went across the floor, it went into the head. And when she rolled the other way, that's head door slammed shut. And the cook, I don't even remember who the cook was. He grabbed his fork, he went over there and he roared, we're going to that door, come here you SOB. And he, nailed that bird with a fork and he threw it back into the oven and slammed the oven shut. And that's the end of the cook's story on the schooner boat. Next one is the Heritage. <clears throat> schooner Heritage, one of the newer vessels of the fleet. And the cook is uh, Sean Grimes. And uh, he is not- How we doing? Are you there, Sean? I'm right here. I'm here, Jim. Yeah. Here's a beautiful picture of you making the pies. Are these pies for the lobster bake? Um, they, they very well could be. Uh, they're, uh, I've made uh, many of them over the years. I uh, cooked on board for six years before I ended up purchasing the vessel. And because uh, if there's anything I like doing more than cooking, it's actually sailing the ship. So <laughs> that was the so uh, evolution there. But so we, we were, uh, we were, yeah, we've been really busy over the year. Uh, last year cooking up, uh, you know, maple, honey, mustard, glaze, salmons, risottos, lasagnas, charcuterie boards for miles. And uh, how do you oh accomplish all that? Well, you stock plenty of firewood. <laughs> oh lots of firewood. God. Yeah. And, great, uh, great. So you, you've, been, you've been cooking there. You were well acquainted with the galley. Now you have three hats. My God, look at that. I got it right here. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's the uh, chef's hat, and uh, my buddy uh, Nick Laz made this out of uh, one of the old heritage sails, and uh, oh, he was sure trying was. to get the he was trying to get the pleats uh, ironed on it, and he said, "Well, we don't have an iron." I said, "Nick, it's okay. Just put some aluminum foil down. Go get one of the cast <laughs> iron pans, heat it up on the stove, put a little water on it, and uh, he ironed the pleats." And, and here's the hat years later. And, uh, <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Well, you have three hats. You have a, you have an owner's hat, and you have a captain's hat, and you have a cook's hat now. So that's you're, right. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna have to have three heads to keep up with it all. It seems like that, but uh, we're doing it good so far. And, uh, there, there but, she is uh, sailing along. All her regalia. She's pretty, pretty oh, vessel. And oh yeah, there was this, there was this one time we were sailing up over the uh, the head of Islesboro uh, around uh, Turtle Head and. Uh, and Doug goes, well, I think the win, I wasn't up on deck at the time. We were serving lunch down below because it was raining and we had a rider on oh. board and a full galley of people. And uh, yeah. and Doug told Ben, the uh, my, uh, the co-owner of Heritage now, and he told him, he said, I think the wind's going to pick up when we get around the point. And once we got around the point, oh boy, it sure did. And we dipped the scuppers under the water. And uh, and I had all the, uh, the, the, the galley assistants, they're holding the food on the table and there goes uh, the writer. She goes, whoop, under the galley table, onto the sole. I said, come here, dear. Put her on the chair next to me. And, uh, and it was a grand time, though. <laughs> Everybody was laughing and uh, we made it through and uh, lived another day. <laughs> yeah, we got to we gotta move along here. We, Go right ahead. Yep. We're running, running out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Annie Mount uh, Mally uh, was a cook on the Janie Riggin for years and years. Any, uh, I don't believe is here. Any is beyond uh, the internet. She told me a message. I gave me a message that she wouldn't be able to make it on. But we do have another cook that knew Annie very well, Ellen Barnes. Ellen Barnes, are you here? I am. Um, Annie. Here. Annie's entry into the schooner business was um, uh, one week before we were go, going sailing one June. Uh, my daughter Susie. Um, called and said, Mom, don't hire a mess cook. I know you're looking for one. Annie's just graduating here from Michigan State, and I'm bringing her with me, and we're coming home. And that uh, that's how Annie started in the, on the fleet, in the fleet, and she was my mess cook, and um, then was on deck for a couple of years, and um, she's been on and off to chef school. You can see she's written many books. She's a great Fantastic chef. Yeah, and look at has just look, retired from the look, Windjammer business. And, 
Leave that lid out. All that, all, that, all, that, all, that, all, all that food, all that wonderful food laid out there on the deck. My God. Sure. They, they fed them on the rigging. And then the, the rigging was sold. And, uh, and the cook now is Mark Godfrey. And here he is telling people stories about the oysters. J&E Regan was an oyster boat, Delaware Bay oyster boat originally, and uh, made quite a lot of money in the oyster business, the oysters as they call them down in the Delaware Bay. And uh, amazing, amazing business. They're, those wonderful mud oysters that they had in the Delaware Bay made fortunes. There were more millionaires living in Southern Jersey, living in places like Bival and Shell Pile than there were in anywhere else, even in the suburbs of New York and in, in New Jersey. They were all down the southern end of such a business down there. There's a little down the lower right of the uh, j and &E rigging loaded with oysters. You can see the piles of them on deck there. They've got a great load. They're headed back for market. The old boat hauled out. They're headed back for market. They sell those things and they send them up to Philadelphia and the people eat them on the streets in Philadelphia and they pay enormous prices for those oysters. And uh, it was a great, great business back in those days. I guess this is the galley in the J&E Regan. Do we have anybody from the J&E Regan? Anybody sailed on the J&E Regan? Rick, do you, you know this galley? She's got her home clarion stove there. I have. Who's it's it? Dana. Who's it's Dana. Jane, oh, did you cooked on the J&E? Uh, no, I crewed a bit, but I'm sorry, my sound is broke bad. Um, um, no, I crewed on, I cooked on the Tabor, uh, but I uh, helped Annie with her cookbook. Oh, oh, great. Uh-huh. Good, Jane. But Thanks. yeah, we'll I, get, I passengered we'll, a few times too, but yeah, we'll I get, just go play we'll now. Get, we'll get to you in another minute. Here's the, the lobster. I cooked one Jane trip on the rig in. It's a great galley. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's Bethany. I filled in one trip for Annie when she was uh, taking her oldest daughter to college a couple years mm -hmm. back and that galley is superb. I actually don't tell the stove on the table, but I uh, actually prefer that one. <laughs> Bethany, what vessel have you not cooked on? Uh, there's a few yet. Yeah, get busy, get busy. <laughs> hey, we gotta get Anna Miller up here now. Anna, this is Ladona, oh my God, the Ladona, uh, one of the, one of the newest uh, uh, reconstructions of the fleet here. The Ladona has just been rebuilt from the keel up through, thanks to uh, Noah Barnes and Jay Brow, J.R. Brow. And uh, Anna Miller, are you there? What what you got in the oven, yep, Anna? I'm here. <laughs> what you got in the oven, Anna? Um, like that one there, I just pulled out. What's that? That's your that's your last meal on the boat. <laughs> no, Tell actually, um, one of the things that <laughs> I started out a few years ago. Uh, one of the things I do is uh, the first trip and the last trips of the season, I go ahead and I make a turducken, which most people think is the butt of a joke, but it's actually a thing. And I put one together on the boat every summer, or I should say two at this point now. So that's a lot of fun. I think that was the first one I ever made about, I don't know, five years ago now, I think. Great, great. <laughs> yeah. Tur and then we've got turkey. some uh, donuts frying one morning on the last day and then the galley full of um brooks like breakfast prep like we got rolls going for or, or biscuits or muffins yep. or something for breakfast and some eggs laid out so all kinds of good stuff going on there going on yeah and here we are having lobsters <clears throat> lobsters on deck Are you sharing that screen? Uh, just about, but yeah, every now and then we'll do it. It's, it turns out to be a nice afternoon and the weather and the wind is just perfect in the view. So when we can, sometimes we just fire it up and do it up on deck for the guests. And yep. there they are having a great time. We got the lobster, the corn, the yep. Yep. butter, all the sides to go along with it. So That's yeah, it was a beautiful place. afternoon out there. I think that's great. We always used to stop on the best day of the sailing. And of sailing. course, more, more provisions for the cook. I've got a PSA that I... Yep. Yeah. I've got a bunch of vegetables there, which I get every week from a local farm. And it's, it's like Christmas when I get those bags of vegetables all lined up. We've got some beets and fennel and squashes and tomatoes. And I think that's one of my, uh, again, morning prep for the day. I've got eggs and... Yeah. 
bread going. It's my favorite time of the day on the boat is first thing in the morning when I wake up, fire up the stove, get the coffee ready and get all my plans yeah. and provisions and my lists ready to go for what I'm serving for the rest of the day. Well, now tell me, tell me about these black things hanging here. Ah, uh, so every time, like, so we do on the and the Ladona a uh, wine trip. And so that particular year, I decided I wanted to try and make some squid ink pasta. So that's the sheets rolled out and hanging above the stove to dry a little bit. Oh my they're, gosh. Uh, yeah, getting ready to go. And there's a, uh, I think it's a shrimp and anduja sauce to go along with it. And then some other pictures of, I mean, it's a boat, so you know things are going to happen. There's some pots and pans sliding around on the sole. And then on the uh, right hand side there and the very bottom in the middle is when I was on Tabor Boy down in the Caribbean. So trying to serve lunch offshore, people are kind of bracing themselves up against the stove and then the coffee for the entire winter yeah. or we hoped it would last the entire <laughs> winter down there in all those boxes. That was Tabor Boy, huh? Yes. What galley is this? <clears throat> That's the donut. Uh, the That's picture the that I'm still looking at. Yeah. This is Oh, yes, yeah. that's Ladona, yep. This is it Ladona? So, boy, she's pretty fancy, isn't she? I've never been in her galley. That is lovely. Yep, nice and bright and wide open, high overheads. And yeah. it's gorgeous. I absolutely love it. So we do a, yeah. a, um, a la carte yeah. breakfast for the guests in the morning. So that's kind yeah. of like leading my own little cooking show. People can watch me cook breakfast, eggs to order, pancakes, and all that good stuff, and pull things out of the <laughs> oven the soups and the rolls and I got some roast potatoes down there and up in the Jim. top I've got some lemon curd that I made in camp one year. <laughs> Jim, we des we designed that galley for Anna. Did you really? I believe yeah. it. I believe she was it. with us. She yeah. was with us for six years, five years on the Tabor and Something that's, like that. And we were we were determined to try and bamboozle her into the rest of her life. So we built the galley <laughs> to her spec. <laughs> well, better luck next time. <laughs> well, now we've it's great. On to yeah. the... Absolutely love it. Good. We got to move on to Lewis R. French here. Carla, I don't know if Carla's on. on I I called to uh, try and get <clears throat> get a hold of these people, but I didn't. Uh, Rick Lewis, probably you know Carla better than anybody. Uh, yeah, Carla yeah. Carl was cook on uh, the French for a couple of years. Uh, Three years? What what date? Was uh, 15 I, I think as you say there, 2015 to 2016. Yeah, yeah. She had a great smile. Oh yeah, she was she was great. She's out in yeah. uh, San Diego now, I think. Oh, is she? <clears throat> and uh, then that was, Catherine... that was one of her uh, ass assistants she, uh, on the French. Uh, the assistant Catherine, cook, Catherine, uh, Ka Catherine uh, also uh, spends time up on deck, so uh, they have dual duty. Double duty. Yep. And Dan Conover had to do double duty. I guess the French here yep. do that. Yep. And then the merry day, Ellie, Ellie Allen. Uh, you, I knew you were on there somewhere. Ellie. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Tell me, Ellie, what's going on here on the right-hand picture? What, what are the... Uh, that right-hand picture there, that was a caprice salad that we did one afternoon. So we had a whole oh. bunch of tomatoes to get rid of. Um, tomatoes, basil, we made pesto on board and tossed everybody together. It was really tasty. And on the left, you put in something in uh, Baked oil? sweet potato. Yeah, baked sweet potatoes uh, directly in the firebox. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How's the galley on the merry day? You enjoyed it? It's awesome. Like compared to some of the other boats, it's it's pretty spacious. <laughs> and it is um, pretty, pretty spacious. Yeah, yeah, it's bright. I've got an overhead skylight. Let's in a ton of light. You can see up the sides all the time. And there's like there's a lot of light, lots of space. You have you have a beautiful arm there. Thank you. What's on the other side? A clipper ship? No, not yet. The other arm's bare. <laughs> uh huh. That's pretty neat. The yeah, Mary Day is a great vessel. We, when Bud Hawkins had her, we used to race all over the bay all the time. She's quick. You take, take the stove lid off in order to heat the coffee in the morning? 
Um, so I take the inserts out a lot to do lots of different things. So I like to roast vegetables directly on the open flame. Do that oh. a lot. Um, and mm -hmm. then like if I need to get something sauteing, so you need like a lot of really high direct heat, I'll pull the inserts out and put the pans directly yeah. over the open flames. And right. uh, it, it's like right. cooking on a modern stove, except it smells good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, lo it, it looks like your stove has a glass front on the firebox. <laughs> nope, so that I just had it open. We had just been feeding it and thought it was a cool picture to show off. Oh, it's just open. Oh yeah, uh -huh. great. Yeah. It's pretty cozy in there. Those doors open up far enough that they can touch your legs. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Yeah. We're going to move on to the Merry Day, the Roseway now from the Merry Day. And here's Jaina. Jaina, come back. And Shelly, come back. Okay. I guess Shelly's visiting, um, is she? No, no. Yeah, I'm just visiting. <laughs> this, is, this is Roseway's gallery. Yeah, that, that was in the Roseway Galley, um, and yeah. that was an article that was done in, I can't even remember what the newspaper was at that time. It was a main gazet, a main something, yeah. yeah. And, I don't remember that either, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. You're up, Jaina. I'm yep. no more space. You have your air space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's the old stove, the old shipmate stove. That's the one that uh, Orville and I... Put in there and designed for Andrea. The, she yeah. said she would like to see it in this corner and then she didn't like that corner so we moved it over to the other side and then she didn't like it over there so we moved it over to the far side and she didn't like it and it finally ended up where it was in the very beginning. That's the way you designed that uh, Roseway galley. And there's Ducky and Jana. Now, <gasps> Woo, oh, look, oh, there we are. Hi, she ra, -ra. <laughs> Hi, Ducky. Well, now, Tell me who who worked when on here. Um, let's see. I was on there in '83. I think I was a passenger, and then um, one of the girls' moms got sick, and so I went in as galley girl and finished uh -huh. out the season. And Gina, when did we work together? Do you remember? Yeah, '87 and '88. Yeah. Years, and then I stayed on a few years after that, a few other more summers. Yep. And I did a delivery from St. Thomas back. And then Dan and I worked on the Pauline for Ken and Ellen Barnes after that. Oh, I think. On, the, on the Pauline. Great. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I was on the Merry Day, too, for one season, I think, with Steve and Chris. Did you? Uh -huh. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah. a lot of experiences, huh? <laughs> yeah, and my big thing, and I think for anyone who had been in the business for a while with Orville and Andrea Young, you know, Andrea taught me how to... I guess the word would be to punt. If you don't have everything you need, then you take something that you have and you make something out of it. And um, and one time she was on board, she was giving Alan, Orville was on giving Alan Talbot a break, a week off. And I don't know, we didn't have enough of something. So she said, well, what do we have? And I'm like, well, we've had a couple of cans of tomato juice rolling around in the bilge. And I'm like, we, we need to use that. <laughs> <laughs> and so she came up and she made this beautiful tomato bread and it had basil in it. And I think Parmesan cheese. And, you know, and, and later when I worked on the Merry Day, you know, I ran out of something and I had cream cheese. And so we ended up making um, a cream cheese crust for our quiche and it was great and but that's what I learned from her she was very she was a great teacher a great teacher and Orville would come through the galley and he would say oh I see you're frosting the brownies and it's like yeah because we need to do something new and different because we're tired of making the same old same old and <laughs> he's like Oh, you didn't burn them. And, and Andrea was like, oh, Lord, get out of here. That was Orby baby. Yeah, it was Orby baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was. The, cap 
the captain he used to call Orvi Baby. That's right. That's uh, right. And there, you know. uh, that's Andrea down in the lower left there. Didn't you tell me she, she dropped something down in the hold when she was rooting around for the tomatoes? Oh my God. So we're all in the forecastle sleeping and she was getting up to cook the next morning and it was dark, whatever. And I hear her and something's dropping. And then she'd be like, oh. And so I turned on my light. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I dropped my dentures. And she was rooting around for her dentures. I was um, dying. It was hysterical. It was a down, lot of fun. Down in the build? Down in the forecastle. Not in oh, the build. In the yeah, no. in the forecastle. Oh, okay. Well, yep. well, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, that's that, honest. Yeah, honest that's all right. Yeah. Who's the, who's the gal here or doing the bread? Doing the, that was Pam Thompson. She was the cook when I came on as a passenger. And then two weeks later, I was working in the galley because one of the assistant cook, her mom got sick and I took her place. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's Ducky. He, she always flirts with the old guys. The old, oh, guys, yeah. the old guys happen to be uh, Rick Lewis's father. Oh my That's God! Rick's father. Oh yeah. Yes. My my dad sailed on the uh, yes the Elsie out of Gloucester back when she was a dory fishing schooner at nine years old. Uh, yeah. He was a cabin boy, and so he's probably telling you stories about that. But he was also a cook uh, in World War II. Uh, he was coast guard, but he wound up getting sunk three times. Oh <laughs> my God! That is the coolest thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's Jaina, Jaina with a sheepish look on her nose. It's, it looks, it looks like she's trying to get away with something. I don't know what it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I might, I might have had a, a change of plan in the menu there. That looks like when the roseway was down in the Caribbean there. So those look like little Christophines in that pan. That looks like some Caribbean food down there. I cooked down in the, in the Caribbean uh, a few yeah. times too. But uh, oh, yeah, yeah you, we have to be resourceful if we ran out of something. So that's probably what was going on there. Great, great. Okay, well, coffee had to be on deck on time. Oh, <clears throat> right. There are the, there are the two, two buddies right by the main mist there, two buddies. That's right. Yeah, Aww. friends to the end. Yeah. That's the, way, yep. that's the way to do it. And, of course, the ubiquitous lobster bake. There's Ducky stuffing herself right there in the foreground. Hey, easy does it there, big boy. <laughs> 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 I, do I, have, I do have one story about running out of something though speaking of running out of something so it was a saturday or friday afternoon we always made ice cream on on friday afternoons and we had run out of rock salt so then we can't use the old-fashioned the hand cranking uh freezers without the rock salt so we get to al tabbit C captain al to <laughs> call you jim on the radio i don't know if you remember this basically no. saying, you know, can we borrow some salt? And so as it happened, the adventure and the Roseway were sailing around the same region of the, of the bay. So they, you guys set up a rendezvous. And so uh, maybe an hour later, the adventure comes sailing up right next to the Roseway. So we're under sail, right side by side, we get closer and closer until we're about 15 feet apart, I'd say. And one of the deckhands on the adventure got to put the rock salt in a bag, Put it on the end of the boat hook, the boat stood hook, up on I the rail, that. yes, yeah. held onto the shrouds, <laughs> leaned out as far as he could, and one of the roseway deckhands did the same thing on his yeah. rail with his boat hook, reached way out, and after a couple tries, he grabbed that rock salt and brought it on board. So <laughs> there was tears all around, and the vessels, you know, peel away because they're like so close to each other, but we did have ice cream that night, so that yeah. worked out well. Isn't Thank that amazing? That. Crazy things we did back in those days. Yeah. Well, we're down the Stephen Tabor. We're getting there, my G. We're getting there. So here they are, the old, big, big old Stephen Tabor, built in 1871. Uh, one of the older, uh, she and the Lewis R. French are the oldest windjammers. And uh, both of them, boy, they go 150 years. And here's the, the old Tabor's galley. I'm so excited to see that. That beam, that beam right up over the stove there, I remember hitting my head on that beam, the end of that beam. Oh my God, I hit my head on that. So many people must have hit their head on I don't understand why we never put a rubber pad on it or something. Uh, Ellen, do you know why we never put a rubber pad on the end of that? Well, 
Well, I'll tell you what, Jim. Um, when I came aboard, I was much lower than that beam. And oh, I can honestly right. attest to the fact that I, I never put my head on that beam. And I for, this galley absolutely made they, for me. I forgot uh, they shorted you on the legs when they, when they were yes, born. Yes, this is, this is actually not the old, old galley. This was the galley um, after our rebuild. And it was made specifically for my height. Um, I, I could walk under everything. I could cook right on this side of the stove. Um, really? It was great. Um, what, I, what I really want to say is that things have evolved over the years. Yeah. And sure? I considered yeah. myself no, a mother I'm cook. Serious. I was a mama. And I was a really good cook when I got here. And I started cooking on the Stephen table when I was 43 years old. And I can attest <laughs> to the fact that it is a young woman's job or man's job, definitely. And I, I, um, I, I would like to challenge anyone now to try to cook like these chefs do on these boats <laughs> because it's quite different than it yeah. was when I started. I cooked great food. We, we sailed only six day sails. I knew awesome. exactly what I was having. Fish on Monday, baked beans on Saturday, turkey on Friday night. It oh was it was pretty wonderful. These, <laughs> these chefs on the boats now yeah. actually do some six days, some four days, some three days, and yeah. they serve hors d'oeuvres that are good enough to be a dinner meal. I've always said yeah, if, if you eat hors d'oeuvres on these boats, you've eaten a meal. They yeah. they work hard. Um, they're trained differently than we all were. We came out of the old Andrea Young tradition. We yeah, did. Right. I, he really right. taught me how to cook on a on a schooner, and wholesome, uh, wholesome food and lots of it. That oh, a lot of food. So Bethany might still be here, and she um, cooks on the table quite a bit. And uh, oh, hi Helen, how are you? Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the young Ellen, and I am not an admiral, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, maybe I am. Uh, yeah. Bethany, you still here? I am here, Ellen. Hi. That's a show. Well, one, one, more, one more picture of you, Ellen. One uh, more picture of you. My, my husband soup. is a cartoonist. So <laughs> he's, been, he's been doing cartoons of me since I was quite young. Yep. Uh, that's one of them. That was me. That looks just like me. And passengers <laughs> used to say, how can you well, let your husband do that? That's just well, not I... right. But it's fine. Yeah, this is also our galley in a funny sort of photograph. Yeah, is yeah a, this is a this is Bethany a panorama is that I took. <laughs> <laughs> that Bethany did. It looks huge. It does look huge like this. Uh, I can say for me, it's not huge. I'm a little bit taller than Ellen, so I do hit my head occasionally. Um, but you can see I'm making my poor messmate load in the wood. I am notorious for flying through a lot of wood. So we fill that box. If there's an empty cabin, we fill the cabin. If there's an empty bunk, we fill the bunk. Uh, frequently, we will ask Ellen and Ken and Jane to uh, go get us more wood <laughs> during the course of a trip. So yeah, lots of wood on the table. That's great. That's great. But you, 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 cooked on, you cooked on a lot of different vessels, haven't you? <clears throat> Yeah, so I started on the Tabor. Um, I didn't know anything about cooking on Windjammers. I came and interviewed with Jane, and I think the final question of the interview was, what's your name and can you start tomorrow? Um, so I ended up <laughs> cooking for Noah, and then I filled in for Anna on the Ladona once that rebuild was done. Uh, I filled in for Annie, like I said, on the Riggin, and then I uh, got the opportunity to cook on the schooner Columbia, which is a little bit more wow. of a fancy yacht um, down oh, in the Southern oh Caribbean God. a couple of years ago. So that was pretty exciting. A little bit different oh. kind of a galley. <laughs> oh, God, that's magnificent. Is magnificent. that a rack of lamb? It mm -hmm. is a rack of lamb right in the I cast iron pan. Yeah. yeah, I know. Really unfortunate. Nobody ate it. It was terrible. <laughs> what, what, what are these on the other side? 
Um, these are some like a uh, take on sushi that I did during our wine trip uh, for the South American night. So the Tabor and Ladona both have wine pairing trips and Anna and I uh, this year finally for the first time got to cook one together. Um, so we each made a different appetizer and then we'd make kind of the same entree and there's always a theme. So whether it's Spain or France or South yeah. America. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. Uh, oh, I don't know if yeah. any of you guys know Cody, Cody Smith. Uh, he is on? not a mess mate, but he was my mess mate on this horrible, horrible day. Oh, God, I love <laughs> this picture. There was uh, So when I used to sail, I would just fill in at the end of the season for Anna. So Anna would go up until September, mid-September, and then I came a couple years and did the end of the season. Uh, you guys know sailing in October is sporty. Um, so this was a particularly sporty day. I actually don't know if we ever served lunch, um, but there was a certain <laughs> point where I believe I hit Noah with a wooden spoon um, <laughs> with my like unhappiness about the situation. And then what you see uh, over here on the right is my foot covered in a jar of, uh, I think, lard or duck fat that I had been saving <laughs> for breakfast on the last morning. Uh, we healed over, and you can see uh, all of the vinegar and wine and pots and pans went on the floor. I got doused with the uh, fat there. I think Cody started drinking that bottle of wine uh, right then and there. Needless to say, we, you know, anchored and served appetizers and dinner. Uh, we oh, had dear. a particularly fetching deckhand filling in that trip. And somehow uh, items of my clothing, like, ended up in his bunk. It was just a crazy, it was a crazy, crazy. day. <laughs> crazy day. Okay. Crazy day. That's me that on Ladona filling in for Anna. Yep, that's on Ladona. I'm making some uh, lobster Benedict for breakfast. You know, we love to yep. use the leftover lobster at least... <laughs> You know, at least one more time. You never want to leave people uh, only eating lobster once. So I like to do like a lobster Benedict on the last morning. Right. Wow. So you Jim. have lobster rolls. Uh, yeah. So these are from the COVID season. I was actually the cook on the table. So it was just us and Ladona out there. Uh, and Noah decided that we were going to throw a small boat race. So... We, you know, weren't able to have a bunch of people on the boat, but we had a bunch of small boats coming around and I made uh, lobster roll torpedoes. So we wrapped <laughs> them up and we launched them at the small boats as they came around on their race course. So that was a really, that was a highlight yeah. of sort of a tough season. Great. Well, yeah, here you go. <clears throat> That's Columbia. Uh, for those of you who have never seen her inside, there's a little glimpse there. Uh, oh, I think I'm serving, boy. that's a tuna ceviche. I actually bought that tuna in a garbage bag at a marina from some guy's cousin. Um, so. <laughs> oh, hey. And the mask. Oh, yeah, that's COVID season. So, you know, when chefs, uh, uh, when yep. chefs do fit out because there's no sailing to be done. And, and these? <clears throat> um, so this is, uh, the product on the right is a duck prosciutto, which is kind of Anna's specialty. And the one on the left is a duck mortadella that uh, I made for the Tabor and Ladona at the beginning of the season. We do a big day where we break down like 24 ducks so that we have charcuterie made for the whole season. So that's something that uh, Anna and I have already been cool. talking about for this next year. Like, when is duck day? What are we going to make? So we get all stocked up. And if you come early in the season, uh, you're guaranteed to get some. But if you come in October, you might be out of luck. <laughs> and I only had a peanut butter sandwich for dinner. Oh, man. <laughs> and it takes us like days to process all this, too. <laughs> and here you are buying yeah. your mackerel. <clears throat> yeah, so that's buying fish on Columbia. I think that's, uh, if anyone knows Seth Salzman, he's standing beside me there. Um, yeah. So yeah, just buying some local fish, trying to feed our guests. <laughs> That's wonderful, wonderful, Bethany. Thank you very much. I just want to yeah, know if you'd welcome. like, if you'd like to have a good read sometime. I have, I have a book for you. Look at this. These, these are my memoirs. These are forty years of voyaging, and uh, you can buy it at the Sail Power Steam Museum. Uh, but only twenty bucks. A uh, great read, and even some of it's true. You know, you can't really tell. But uh, that concludes our broadcast with cooks. I take my hat off to all you cooks. My God, you cooks are such wonderful people. And you do such a great job for all these windjammers. 
And uh, I thank you all for coming and sharing your memories. I'm sorry we don't have more time. Uh, I could have sat here and gone on another three or four hours, but I think probably everybody's bottoms are getting a little bit sore and a little bit tired, want to stretch out a little bit. Thank Rick Lewis very much for the photographs. And if you have any questions, why jump in right now and ask them before we hang up. No questions? Jim, I've got one comment I want to make. Please do. Um, uh, if it's good. <laughs> if, there's, if there's any question as to who the most important person on board is, there is nothing in the world like the emotional whiplash of sitting all smug and happy back on a quarter deck, standing up on the weather side, putting the rail down, putting the scuppers deep in the water, having the time of your life, enjoying the the, 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 the breeze and the air and the guests are all gathered around, everybody's smiling. And that cook sticks his or her head out of the galley scuttle and fixes you with the most uh, 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 just, just, just gut wrenching, hairy eyeball, and all joy and warmth leaves your body, and you know, you know the true terror of what that look means. What and are you, you begin, doing to me? You begin, you begin looking immediately for the nearest harbor entrance. <laughs> that is the true testament to who, who the most important person on board is. And I, yeah. I, uh, I have, I have gotten that look. Called out, Noah. <laughs> I have gotten that look so many times from Anna, from Bethany, from Amy, from my, my dear mother, my dear sainted mother. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I love it when we get a little breeze of wind. We get a little breeze of wind up in the topsail there, and the old vessel starts to heel over, and both cooks jump up from where they're sitting there, enjoying the view, and, and they race to the galley as fast as they can because they got to attack the boat. The, whatever's in the oven. Yeah. 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 Probably. Yeah. <laughs> or watch it fall out of the stove or run out of the stove. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or it's on the floor and you have to just eat it. That's right. Just keep it up. Well, it's been, been great fun. Great fun. Thank you all. We really enjoyed it. I hope you'll come back and see it. Visit the world famous Sail Power Steam Museum when you get a chance. I'm going to sign off. Thank, thanks again, and uh, happy sailing. Bye. Thank you. Have a great job, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Good to bye. see you. Hello. Bye. Hello, bye. Hello Jackie. Bye, Pammy. Hey, bye. Bye, Captain. <laughs> bye, guys. That was fun. <laughs>